Hello, everybody. I'm Patty Peterson. We have a very special guest for you today. His name is George Myers. And little do you know, some of you watching this show, that there was a very, not only a happening nightclub out in the Minnetonka area, but a wonderful musician who spent his time there and in Minnetonka. And uh, George, welcome to the Thank show. You. Thank you for joining us here. Thank you. Pleasure. All right. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about your history and um, and learn about what influenced you as a musician. You're a trombonist, right? Right. OK, so yeah. what I like to start with is what was it like growing up in your household? Did you have people who played instruments? Did your parents play music on uh, phonograph music? Or what, what was it like in your environment growing up? There, was, there wasn't much. And I grew up out on Lake Minnetonka when it wasn't, a, it wasn't the play lake it was now. It was a summer destination. And uh, there wasn't a lot to do because there was only people there in the summertime. And so uh, I started playing trombone. And I was at Mound uh, High School at the time. Or, and the, the band teacher was not a trombone player, he was a clarinetist. And at that time, they built Orno. And we were the third class in Orno. Okay. And the, they hired a guy by the name of Warren Alm, who was a terrific trombone player. And he taught, taught me artificial positions and all those things that trombone players know. And, and that really got me going. And so I had a lot of time to practice and so forth, and I, I just, I fell in love with uh, with playing trombone. And I used to play uh, Amsden duets with a trumpet player in school. And so, you know, we could, it was, it was plenty fast. I played Mendelssohn's concerto for violin on trombone for the, wow. for the, the high school, you know, get together and all that sort of thing in the state. We went down to the university for, the state things and that sort of thing. So that's that's kind of where I got. And I at that time, you know, jazz was big. Yeah. Uh, big bands. You know, we had a chance in high school. We'd go to prom ballroom and stand on the rail and watch all the big bands that came to town. Right. Chet Growth had, Chet Growth had a had a, a rehearsal studio on the second floor of his store, and you could go in there as a young guy and sit next to people that could play. For instance, Leo Fine, I think, was playing with Tommy Dorsey at the time, and he'd come down to that thing, and trumpet players could sit next to him, and that's when you learn, you know, you can really learn. Right. I, this is a story I've never heard before, so that's very interesting for me to hear that. And yeah, you were at the, uh, the hip or the elbow of someone who was already pounding the pavement in a field that... Right probably wanted to get into. So what what age were you when you started playing trombone and where did it go from there? Oh, I guess I was probably uh, 12 or 14, something like that when I started. And, 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 I, and I, you know, as I said, there wasn't a lot to do. So I was able to practice a lot. And you put some, some records on in your bedroom and play along with them and think you're on the bandstand with the big people, you know, and it was great. There were some great musicians, you know, in Minneapolis at the time. Yes. Dave Frischberg, yep. Don Ellis, and uh, I, I had the opportunity to go play a rehearsal with them, and that just turned my mind around. And then you have you have the Peterson family, which you're a part of, and the Hewarts, yes. you know, yes. the and, and Ted Hewart. Yep. And so there was a lot of good music. And I, I don't know what the kids are doing today. It, it's a shame, really. Well, what's interesting is there's still enough jazz out there and interest in the big band scene and expression through jazz that you'd be nicely surprised, I'm happy to say. Um, it, it isn't at the forefront, unfortunately, so we don't hear that much about it, but it's still happening. And I know that Dean Sorensen has got He's the uh, professor at the University of Minnesota, and he has the big band jazz ensembles, jazz studies, and the Petersons have created a scholarship uh, mm. for kids who are learning jazz just to help them along with their education. So it is still That's happening. I can attest to that. Let's talk a little bit about in your youth. You mentioned the prom ballroom. Was that an age 21 and up, or could 
could all ages go in and see the different touring musicians? You could go in there, you just couldn't drink. Yes. You know, which I didn't care about anyway. We were just kids in high school. And of course, the Miracle Ballroom was going on at the time too, sure. which uh, Big Stoop Chamberlain had a band there and so forth. And, and then when I was in high school, uh, there was a, there was a, 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 Larry Elliott had a traveling band and, and uh, you, we'd go out of town on Friday and Saturday and come back on Sunday. And he played those ballrooms out in the country. It was modern and old time or whatever you want to call it. But I was making 12 bucks, 12 and a half bucks uh, a shot at wow. those in those days. And the kids, they, they'd set pins at the bowling alley for weeks to try to make that much, you know, so. My goodness. So you became yeah. a touring musician at a very young age. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then after I, I joined the service, took the horn with me and uh, I didn't play in a band in the service. I was in, in a radar, but uh, I took the horn with me and I played over in England and churches when we were over there and I played in Montreal and clubs and hotels up there. I mean, it's, it's just a terrific thing, the music thing, you know, and, and it, you can do anything if you can play, I think, you know. I'm interviewing George Myers here, who uh, was resident of Minit uh, Minnetonka, and now you're in Arizona, but a musician by trade who was a touring musician at a young age, and so just reintroducing who you are for those people who are just joining us right now. So when you were touring uh, in the armed services, did you sit in with bands that were in the different hotels and clubs? Is that what you were ta just talking about? Well, I was at an air base up in Plattsburgh, New York, SAC base. And, oh. and, and so I could drive over the border into Montreal and they, at, the, at the end of Lake Champlain, there was a hotel. And uh, I got in with the guys there and they gave me $25 a weekend, plus gave me my room and board and so wow. forth. So I made more money on the weekends playing up there than I did in the service, you know. My gosh. <laughs> well, so you were hooked. You were hooked. Yeah. And you were yeah. in the service until the late 50s, if I remember right. 58, and then, yeah. And then what did you yeah. do? Did you come back to the Twin Cities? Yeah, I came back home and uh, and somehow Dick Brusick, who on the downbeat, got my name. And uh, I went over there and started playing with them. Bill Bowden was playing uh, sax. Joe Broadfoot was playing piano and Dave Faison on bass and Dick on drums. And it was basically a blues band. That's all it was. It wasn't and, bad. And so, yeah, we just we just played pretty much some blues and some things. So then I talked to Dick and I wrote a book for True Trombones because Kay Winding and J.J. Johnson were big at the time. And so Byron Snow from Orno and myself, we started playing the two trombone thing, jazz. And then we went to four trombones and that's when Leigh Kamen came out and did the broadcasting. That had to be so great. And so you were aired live, weren't you? Yeah. With when yes. Cameron came up. And then after that, Tom Talbert came back to town and he had a band, 12 piece band that he wrote for. He didn't play much, but he, he liked to write and he wrote this book for 12 piece. And I thought it was great because it was two, was four sax, two trumpets, two trombones and a French horn and a rhythm section. And you could get all wow. kinds of neat sounds with that. And so I, I started writing, doing my own writing uh, with that instrumentation. And right. that's what ended up the downbeat band. You're walking along the street, or you're at a party, or else you're alone, and then you suddenly dig. You're looking in someone's eyes, you realize. And Dick, Dick Bruzic, I can't say enough for him, you know, he, he supported us. I played out there three nights a week and uh, and he just kept the jazz and we could play all kinds of fast stuff and and go off and on all solos and all kinds of stuff, you know, so it was great. Where was the downbeat located? Right in the middle of Spring Park. They call it Skunk Hollow. 
Okay. And then next to us was an old, there was an old bar called Don and Babes. And next to that was the Lakeview. And Dick and Don Ma had that Lakeview in those days. And they had, right. God, they had the Basie Band in there. They had Dave Brubeck. They had all kinds of big names that came in there. So we could slide next door and see those guys, you know. I mean, so it fun. was really a jazz spot. Wow. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. All in that area, you, you had that much music going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's so great. So I hear tell that there was some, uh, that, that, that Woody Herman was playing. Do you have a story about Woody Herman? Well, he yeah, he came to the Downbeat. And uh, at that time, I was playing, you know, gigs around there and in Minneapolis. But my dad... I was in the x-ray business and I had electronic training and I was working for my dad. So Woody came to town and the guy was leaving that played the second jazz chair. And so uh, they'd asked me if I wanted to sit in and play. So I, I'll never forget it. I mean, I got up there and we sight read Golden Wedding or something, which is really upbeat. And there's a big long trombone yeah. solo in it. And when Woody wants you to keep going, he just keeps waving his hand. And if you play a wind instrument, you know, when your mouth starts drying out, it's murder. Because you got to have spit to play. And I thought I was going to die before it was over with. But I went on the road with him for a little while. And then my, it wasn't very long, but my, my parents uh, asked me to come back because my dad wasn't doing well and so forth. And I came back to the business. So, And I think at hey. the time... Woody was going to kind of bail out for a while. So, but it was a great experience. And man, when you play every night and you play those charts, you really get some good chops, you know? So, but yes, I, I was, of course, on the comedy band. I had great musicians from, we had great musicians in the Minneapolis area. I don't think people knew a lot about it because, you know, to make some money, they go play the country club scene and so forth. But when they came, out there on Sunday night, I mean, we played some really up-tempo stuff and they were able to stretch out, you know. So, so you're talking about these rooms were listening rooms. They weren't dance halls. Is that right? I'm not sure I understand. Well, I, were they supper clubs where there was jazz? What was the environment like? Because sometimes... At the downbeat? Were, yeah, the downbeat. You mean at the downbeat? A listening room? No, no, it was huge. And it was just a setup deal. And okay. so people would dance. We'd play a we'd oh, play, a, play some dance stuff. Okay, okay. Yeah. But I, we, we didn't play for the dancers because Dick would say, you know, get them off the floor. And he wanted them drinking more. So away we'd go, you know, with uh, right. Sister Sadie or something like that, you know. I mean, and the, the guys loved it. And uh, Don Rustad was one of them that he played lead alto, and then we had Bob Crea, and we had uh, Hagasag. I never had uh, I never had uh, the trombo player out there, but I had Dentley playing, and uh, Percy Hughes even sat in with us, played baritone. Oh my you know, God! So, yeah, right. but it was Sunday nights. You remember, you're, you're too young. You don't remember, but there was no booze in Minneapolis at that time, really, and so. These guys, if they were working, like John Fisker played bass, right. but he worked at the claim room, you know, at the Radisson, and I, it was closed Sunday night. So he'd love to come out there and just wail, you know. Well, I had heard about it for absolutely years. It was a big name, big deal to the downbeat yeah. in itself. So um, how long did you do that? How long were you there? He, he closed up. It must have been in the uh, early 70s. So I think. over 10 years? Oh, yeah. Yeah, at least. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And then Dick, you know, he, he had that place and then he owned the liquor store up on the corner. So he did all right. But uh, I don't remember what transpired, but the, it just went downhill. So. That was the end of it, you know. That's too bad. Well, then when that was done, you must have continued playing trombone and you had all these great charts. Did you take your music elsewhere? No, uh, we, we really didn't. We played some some of the union things, you know, but 
I was starting a business. I got my dad had, had finally gotten out of it and I started my own x-ray business and I didn't have any money. So Tom Mustachio and Fisker and I and Russ Dad and Bob Peck, we played at the Roaring Trunnies for the strippers. <laughs> that was a job you could get, you know. Yes, I've heard a lot of stories like that, to be honest with you. And sure. that that sometimes the bands would be playing for them or they'd be playing a show in between their shows. We I, did I, that too. Yeah, yeah. We, we did, did a bunch of too. charts on what yeah, we did a bunch of charts on West Side Story. And Rusty played uh, vibes and saxophone and flute and whatever. I didn't know and he played so, vibes. Wow, okay. Yeah. And Thomas Dashio, I think he ended up out at the Chan has some dinner theater. Okay, so what was he just a, a like a pit musician then? I out there, he's the director. Uh, I played out there for a show called The Boyfriend, and Arnie Nest was leading that up. And that's when he stuck his head up through the hole in the stage, you know, and yeah. then he would direct because we were underneath the stage playing. I'll so we, we didn't have to put on any fancy clothes or anything. We just go in jeans and play the show, you know. Oh, how fun. You've had a wonderful career, both in your x-ray business and musically as well. What, what's the biggest high point for you when you think about it? Playing with Woody. Absolutely. Playing with Woody. Okay. Yeah. yeah. When I was a kid, I saw him down at, at the prom ballroom. I was high school. And I'll never forget. He had, he had, uh, he had two. He had two trombone players on the thing, and uh, Carl Fontana was playing jazz in the second chair. And nobody has ever since or played trombone like him. And that that dropped my jaw because he did things on trombone that you can't do. And and I worked to try to play like him. And uh, after I got off the road with Woody and went back home business, I'd go out to Vegas and some of the guys had settled out there and we still brought up, Carl was out there at the time. Uh, I mean, it was amazing. Uh, that's, that's when you really get into it because these guys are really good musicians, you know. Uh, and, and, I, you know and you are too. Now, were you part of any recording projects, George? No, I wasn't. Okay. But I had Bruce Balsam played the other trombone on the band at the Downbeat, and he ended up on the Tonight Show. Yes. And I think Tom was on that Tonight Show too, wasn't he? He was on there. He was a sub, but ended up being on the bandstand so many, many times. And yeah, uh, he, yeah he and Lila are still out there, and he's working as much as he possibly can. So fun to hear from That's him. Great. And Bruce got married and moved to, I think it was New Zealand. Yeah, his doctor was a radiologist in St. Paul. Oh my goodness, I'll be darned. Yeah. So yeah. how about something else I like to, to find out is sometimes there are challenges in the music industry. What do you suppose a challenge was that you faced, especially when you were trying to get the musicians and work at the downbeat and, and, and do these gigs? Um, did you have anything that stands out that maybe was a real tough time for you? Uh, I think it was a lot easier for me than a lot of people because when I hooked up with Bruiser, he gave me free reign, you know, to do a lot of things and it allowed me to start writing. And that was a real love to write arrangements. Uh, I just had a little electric piano at the time and I, you know, to write arrangements for the band and see how they come out. And then to be able to get the talent that was in Minneapolis out there at the time and put it together in this band. Uh, that that was a highlight of, of everything. I mean, so I never really had any tough times. Music was always a real stepping stone for me and it allowed me to do things I never would have been able to do otherwise. Can you, you know, give me an example? Well, it just opened so many doors, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, and, and you meet, interesting people and there's nobody more interesting than musicians you know they got stories that'll roll your shirt up your back you know but <laughs> yes and always a joke or two i've known no, yeah. noticed from yeah. being the singer on the bandstand it's pretty pretty fun yeah. stuff 
you know, as you get older, though, and I'm I'm really old. I'm 85, so, and I've got a, a, a Yamaha Genesis now, which yeah. has got all the sounds on it, you know, and so forth, yeah. and a 16 track sequencer at Tascam, and so I can play around and make my own little CDs and this sort of thing. They're not great, but it still keeps my mind going, and that's the biggest thing when you get old. Keep your body and your mind going if you can. And so that's, that's wonderful what I'm advice. So, yeah. George, I want to say, uh, I want to ask you one thing because this is something I like to get from a person who has played music like you have and you had great success. And uh, I wanted, I always like in the beginning of our conversation, um, some up and coming jazz musicians uh, who are really wanting to get into this business. Do you have any advice for them? Just go and try to play as much as you can. God, when I, you know, when I was a kid uh, in training down in Biloxi Air, Air Base, mm -hmm. I'd go into Biloxi and, and just sit in with any band that would let me. I sat in with Gus Stevens down on the, on the shore and everything. And, I, and, and that's the way you learn is by sitting in and playing, playing a bunch of different keys play a bunch of tunes you don't even know hardly and and it's, it's all experience you know and that that's the most important thing to try to get and I find that I don't know how these young people can get experience like that anymore because there was there was so much jazz going on at the time and it was accepted you know much oh, more than it is today. It is. It was the popular music, though, at the time. I know rock and roll was coming in, but I believe if I talk about it, like the Great American Songbook, which my folks played, was the popular music of the time. And so it was accepted. I agree with you totally. Um, you, can't beat, you can't beat the old standards. I mean, right. I still, I got tons of fake books here, and I go through the old, the old standards, and the words are good, the chords are good. You know, it's not major, and I, I, I bought a fake book for, uh, for, for, I don't know, rock or whatever you want to call it. Well, yeah. it's ridiculous. The chords in there, the chords go on. Same chord goes on for eight bars. You know. <laughs> well, yes, it, it it has changed. That's more, you know, I think of the folk music that really has changed. What you and I would call a verse for a great American yeah. songbook is not what a yeah. verse is in that kind of music. It's totally different. Uh -huh. And you have to, like the verse in the Great American Songbook sets up the whole story of a lyric at the beginning of yeah. it. So you, I know that era only because I lived it under my parents as well, Willie and yep. Jeannie. So I love that we can talk here today. And um, do you get out and hear music where you're living now? Is there some good jazz in Arizona? Uh, there probably is further up, but I'm way on the south end, Are and you? I don't get up there too much. There were there was some big band stuff that I I saw. We used to rent up in Scottsdale, and there's more going on up there than there is down where I'm at. So I I don't. They have uh, some entertainment that comes into the place where I live here, yes. but it's, it's phony stuff. I mean, you know, I don't go to much of it. That so people, I, some of them. Yeah, go ahead. Well, they, you know, the they try to mimic somebody else. It's impot. What do you call it? Uh, not yeah. imposters, but you know, they tribute. Well, a tribute, uh, a show like yeah, a tribute. Sinatra yeah. sound alike. Right, exactly. Yeah, the tribute yeah. shows are popular here right now too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, other than that, I, I'm I'm content to play golf four days a week and play my piano. That's that's good. So are you not pulling out your trombone anymore? Nope, don't play it. Okay. You know, I I just feel that uh, unless you're going to practice and you're going to play it routinely, you're not going to play it and you're never going to play it as good as you did. So it just makes you feel bad. And so I, I refuse, I won't play that anymore. I have a friend down here, claims he was a saxophone player and he got it out the other day. And I said, Bill, don't play your saxophone anymore. I mean, my it's husband, terrible. My husband is a drummer, was, I met him on a job. His dad was Mel Pastor. And my husband now calls himself a drum owner. Not yeah. a drum owner. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
Yeah. Uh, Stuart, yeah. So. Anyway, well, how fun for us to have this connection and this conversation. And the all of the stories of the downbeat and and all of the bands that you were able to bring together. And I, what a highlight for me to be able to get to know you. And I, I look forward to speaking to you again. That's very nice of you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Nice, to meet you too. nice to meet you too, especially since you know a few members of my family. I sure do. Yeah, yeah. that's very, very fun. Well, you take care and thank you for joining us here today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. George Myers, everybody. I'm Patty Peterson, signing off. Mm -hmm.